Welcome to Close Horse, the podcast that promises to never donate wet clothing to the Goodwill. I'm your host, Amanda. Today's episode will be the second half of our conversation with Jenny from Late to the Party. If you've ever wondered what happens to the clothes you donate, then this is the episode for you. I know, I know you've been waiting. Guys, do you want to talk about polyester a little bit more? (laughs) Of course you do, right? First off, I'm sure you remember the neon green dress that Melania Trump wore for the last night of the RNC. Well, that dress that launched a million memes, but only for like a day, like it was really short lived in terms of memitude. Well, that dress was made by Valentino and it was Polly Esther. Pretty unexpected, right? But To get that kind of vibrant color and those sort of like permanent sharp pleats, you tend to need a synthetic fabric. And I guess what I'm saying is that polyester can happen at all price points. In fact, some call polyester the tofu of fabrics. And I'm not saying it's me, but now it probably is me. I'm definitely going to call it the tofu of fabrics. Why? Because it can, with the right marinade, no, 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 not the right marinade, with the right processing, it can mimic silk, wool, cotton, or linen. So basically what I'm saying is read those labels. Seriously, read it. Anyway, I've had polyester on the brain a lot lately, which, you know, leads to a lot of Googling. And then before you know it, I found an amazing 1985 article from the Chicago Tribune about the pros and cons of polyester, and it was just a delight to read. So let's travel back in time. If you remember from our, was it two episodes ago? I mean, I lose all track of time now. I told you that after the 70s, polyester was just it was not in a good place. We're talking rock bottom for polyester. After decades on the rise and really hitting its stride in the 60s and 70s, suddenly it just seemed cheap to most Americans. And it was a, I don't know, it was like the main sign that a garment was cheap. If it was made of polyester, it wasn't nice, right? Well, I'm here to tell you that some people believe otherwise. So, You know what? Let's just jump right in with this glamorous cameo from Hollywood. The wardrobe designer of the television series Dynasty, I told you this was going to be glamorous, Nolan Miller, has been kind to the man-made fabric industry. He's very vocal about the fact that he spends a good part of his $10,000 per week wardrobe budget on polyester fabrics. Man, that is a lot of polyester. And by the way, $10,000 in 1985 is almost $25,000 in 2020. That is so much polyester clothing. (laughs) Anyway, this is a quote from Miller. He says, It's to my advantage on the set when an actress has to stay in an outfit for a long time under the lights. The polyester fabric does not need pressing or cleaning after a long time. Also, there are some wonderful taffeta-like polyesters, and I'll go out of my way to look for polyester and negligees, because when you have 30 yards of fabric ready to be cut into garments, you don't want to take the time to iron all that. You know, I'm not ashamed to admit that a few years ago, while we were still in Portland, Dustin and I got really into Dynasty, like watching it every day and talking about it nonstop, sending each other memes, making our own memes, I mean, you know how it goes, right? When you get really into Dynasty. And I got to tell you, I could tell when we were watching it that most of the dresses were polyester. Like, it was just the color, the drape. This totally makes sense to me. Okay, wait, let's go back to Nolan Miller again. I, I think I love him. This is a great little anecdote. 
actress Linda Evans admired a beautiful jacquard the other day and assumed it was a silk. When I told her it was polyester, she said that she had been totally tricked. Listen, Linda Evans was like mega A-list in 1985. So this is quite a celebrity cameo. And as I mentioned, in the 80s, I mean, polyester was bad news, right? No one wanted it. And so almost all designers had shifted into natural fibers. I mean, it was just like a polyester hangover, right? Well, designer Mary McFadden was using a 100% polyester, and it was permanently wrinkled into tiny pleats. If you see a picture, you'll know what I'm talking about, that closely resembled, or at least it seemed at the time, the pleated silks of the 1920s. The article was also sure to call out that her evening gowns, which were 100% polyester, sold in the four-figure category, so meaning thousands of dollars, but I guess not as much as $10,000 because that would be five figures. Anywho, basically double that and you have 2020 money. So really pricey for these polyester dresses, not unlike what Melania was wearing at the RNC. So the reporter of this article also mentioned that Selenese Fibers, which made Fortrell polyester, which was one of the big polyester brands of the 70s, was pretty fond of using McFadden as a prime example of polyester at its most beautiful. And I did look at pictures of her dresses and they really were quite beautiful. I'm sure some of them made an appearance on Dynasty. The Real Real has a few, so you should check it out. But I, and maybe this is just because I worked in the industry for so long, I think they look like polyester. I don't think they look like silk, but I would love to hear your opinion on it. Okay, well, I have to throw in one more quote from our favorite Dynasty costumer. (laughs) I'm sorry. I just love this guy so much. Saying you don't like polyester because of the old poly double knits is like saying you don't like airplanes because of the propellers. Call the slambulance because someone just got burned. (laughs) Okay, well, that's enough Hollywood talk. I mean, this isn't TMZ or people, okay? So stop asking me for this Hollywood talk. So let's get back into our convo with Jenny. You work with a lot of recycled fabric, not fabric that was mechanically recycled, but you're like salvaging fabric. So tell me a little bit about like the challenges you face there and also why you opt to do that. I love the fact that all um, the stuff I make is from vintage fabric and I call it salvaged fabric, which is like kind of a broader term that I use where it's like some of it is salvaged, like stuff that's like from fab scrap that would otherwise probably end up in a landfill or whatever, or stuff like really weird, ill-fitting denim that I find that like is in like the bargain bin, but it's like nice denim. Stuff like that, which I kind of put in like a salvage category. It's not necessarily vintage, but it's something that is secondhand. There is a lot of challenges with that because most of my stuff is one of a kind or like a few of a kind, like limited run because I only have X amount of fabric. The denim is a little bit easier to source and I can always like reproduce like a, you know, a high contrast checkerboard denim patchwork, something like that. But when making with the vintage fabrics, for example, I do a lot of stuff with bedspreads. So I'll take like a 70s bedspread that's really awesome print and make that into a jacket you have to clean it you have to make sure that like if there's any stains on it or anything like that you have to avoid that you have to cut around that there's just like a lot more thought process going through when you're not just rolling out a fresh bolt of fabric and just cutting it out you can kind of do it in a more like you know factory line kind of vibe even if it's just you you know so with me it's it's really like creating each piece is really different and if I sometimes you know, I have this awesome, I had an old maxi dress that a friend had made into a mini. So she gave me the bottom and the fabric is so amazing. And so I've used it for sleeves on like a denim jacket. But you know, I, I didn't have enough, I had needed like another two inches. So I had to like add a little quilted piece, you know, so it's a lot of like problem solving, and care that goes into like, bringing old fabric in kind of vetting it, make sure it's okay. And then like getting it to a place where it can and become a new garment. So it's it does take a little more time. But I mean, that's what makes these sort of special, I think, too. You know, they're um, they're kind of like little art pieces. I mean, not to sound corny, but, you know, there is a lot of like thought and design into each one, which is special, but takes time, you know. Well, and when I talked to you about this before, about your business, you said how you wanted these to be sort of like heirlooms that you would pass down, you know, that they would be around your whole yeah. life because they're special. Yeah. I mean, I, 
I go back to that whole thing of like, you know, when I was thrifting as a kid and finding like these, whatever it was, a, a gown, a, a jacket, a fur coat, you know, anything that felt like, oh, this was made and it was made for mm-hmm. somebody, you know, it, it felt like well-made, there might have been an initial in the inside or, you know, I mean, back in the day, and this is such a weird little thing, but like, to protect these beautiful dresses that were custom made or, or, you know, like just high end, they would put these armpit Mm -hmm. shields. So they're almost look like little shoulder pads, but they're thin and they, they stay, they click in, like have like little snaps to protect, you know, from pitting out your dress. So it'll last longer, like little details like that. I was really always into as a kid too. And I was like, Ooh, wow. So when I create the the pieces that I do, I work on now, I, I just feel like there's that same sense of like, you know, I really want someone to love this thing. And even though it's an un- a little bit of an unusual, interesting piece, it's something that you're going to want to wear a lot because you feel good in it and it's going to last for a while. And it's going to be something that you have in your closet that you can always go back to. That's kind of what I want to create, um, sort of like an heirloom piece. And it's interesting because people are talking a lot about like capsule wardrobe and stuff. And I don't know if you've dabbled into the world of capsule wardrobe, <laughs> which basically is the idea of like, you know, having a select amount of pieces it goes back to the Spark Joy lady. What's her name again? Uh, Marie Kondo. It's sort of on that vibe of like having like, you know, 15 to 20 pieces in your in your wardrobe. And even though I'm not into like having all of like basics and all of the colors being basic, I do like that idea of like, you know, having better made pieces in your closet that will last you longer. It's, it's going to like take away from all this obviously this fast fashion fabric waste but there's just something really nice about that to know you can grab a jacket out of your closet and it's gonna be it's sort of like with you for a while and it it just like feels good on yeah I mean it's always interesting to think about because I have a ton of clothes so a capsule wardrobe is not possible for me but the reason I have so many clothes is from so many like a lifetime of vintage shopping and like collecting and so you know, I'll be yeah. like, okay, well, right now I'm dressing like it's Little House in the Prairie, so that's what in my what's in my closet. But I have bins in the basement of like when I wore mod clothes all the time, or when right. I was like really boho, and so I switch them around. You know what I mean? But like, yeah, it's not about gutting my closet every year and getting rid of everything and starting over. And I think sometimes I get kind of mad at Marie Kondo because I feel like yeah. she set that in motion. And I've read articles about this just crazy flood of stuff appearing in thrift stores when she kind of came up and people now being like oh i'm trapped in my house and i got rid of everything so now i'm buying stuff again like no that's not the point i think that the 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 point of that really is someone like i'm like you as well like i'll never have you know in in my next life i'm gonna come back as like somebody really minimal who has like three dresses and like two jacket you know and like in theory I like love that concept but that's just not who I am I'm more of a like collector you know of like beautiful prints and things and I can't you know again I'm also like someone who's secondhand so I'm not like buying all this new stuff but I think more the idea of that is to be more mindful on the front end Mm -hmm. you know don't just go buy a bunch of stuff and then like purge it because you like gotta get out of your house like I don't really like that concept I think it's like more about thinking about when you're bringing the stuff in the first place. So I do like the idea of sort of, I'm not necessarily a full capsule wardrobe, but being more mindful of instead of buying like a quickie thing at H&M because it's, oh, I'm going to buy this dress and wear it out to this picnic today and then maybe wear it two more times and mm-hmm. then it's going to be garbage. You know, being like, oh, let me pick like a better option of something that I I like more classically maybe. And then it's like, I'll have that for a minute. Even if it's like, I mean, my jackets are not neutral you know i mean they are statement pieces but i think they're statement pieces that like will grow with you these are not new trendy prints and patterns they're things that have been around Mm -hmm. i feel like they're timeless Mm -hmm. in some way even though they i mean that's kind of a contradiction because i do love like time period stuff but i feel like that becomes like classics you know they're not just like some weird trendy print that everyone's gonna be like oh that was like you know two years ago and no one's wearing that anymore so i do i I think it's more about thinking about it on the front end and making more mindful choices there's somebody i follow online that made a comment recently and she was like i've made this pack to myself because you know we go we get into like the idea of these things are more expensive like my jackets aren't cheap you know although they there's definitely could you know ones that are more expensive out there but i feel like you know you 
you fall into this, well, you know, all this like well-made sustainable stuff is, is a lot more expensive and it's hard to do that. And I, and I agree. However, I think that like this person I follow online, it said, you know, what I'm doing is making the choice once a month or whatever the time, once every other month, whatever your, your schedule is to buy a better piece. And it's like, usually it's like anywhere from $125 to like 400 bucks. You know, and maybe that's mm-hmm. not going to happen every month for you on your on your budget, but like say it's every three months or every six months, whatever the time frame is, and you just like commit to like buying something better and nicer and less often, and then you start building a wardrobe that actually has like well made things that you'll have longer and actually be like excited to go back and wear because they're like they feel good on it like lasts it holds up you're supporting small businesses, so I kind of really like that idea too because it is tricky to buy expensive clothing. But if you add up how many times you go to H&M and buy a $20 thing, a $30, or $40, mm-hmm. you know, it's like you can spend 200 bucks on an H&M easily, but then you have, what do you have at the end of the day after three months? You know, it's like not a lot of great stuff. So right, right. I do like that concept of buying better and just maybe less often. Yeah. And I think that there is, I think you made a really good point here. There's this idea that to have a capsule wardrobe or buy less stuff and wear it more often. People think that this means we're saying like buy really basic clothes that don't feel special, right. that are like pieces that you assemble to make an Classics outfit. Or yeah, yeah, yeah. And that that's not what I mean. Like I am a crazy dresser, but everything that I yeah. own is meaningful to me and I've had for a long time and plan on having for a long time. Like it doesn't it doesn't mean right. it can't be cool and unique and special. In fact, if you're buying less clothes, you do want them to be cool and unique and special. And The idea of trendiness, I mean, that what trendiness really says in terms of clothing is like it's disposable. I think back to a few years ago, like one print that you would, no one would be caught dead in now that was such a hot trend for about a year. And I hate using this term, but this is what the industry, how the industry was speaking to it in terms of like marketing and editorial was tribal. Do you remember that? Yeah. Oh, yeah. You, it was like a lot of neons and these geometric prints that were stolen from indigenous people. The like Navajo sort of mm-hmm, resurgence or whatever mm-hmm. people were calling. Again, not a great term. Or like some of it was Aztec, yeah. you know, like in some really vague way. And ultimately it came in, it was like a hurricane and that's all, all the fast fashion people were selling. I would see it on everyone everywhere and you know what a year later so dead that you would walk into the goodwill and that's what every rack was and I still see so much of that there once again like that was the sort of the industry forcing this idea us that we needed this yeah this hideous thing that like wasn't gonna last and now no one wants it I'm gonna be really shocked if I ever see any of that being reused into anything else because we've also I hope evolved as a society since then to know that we would never start churning out Navajo knockoff prints ever again. Yeah. It doesn't mean that we want everybody to wear like weird utilitarian uniforms. <laughs> like, Right. No, exactly. That's what I mean. That's what I was saying where it's like, you know, having, because when I look up capsule wardrobe and I'm kind of like tooting around being like, Oh, what is everybody buying in their capsule wardrobe? I mean, there are certain things like a good pair of Mm -hmm. jeans, maybe a pair of black pants. I mean, there are some basics like we all might have in our wardrobe, a black skirt, Mm -hmm. a thing, whatever, you know, especially if you have to like go to look professional sometimes. (laughs) What's that? Although I still dress like a crazy person. I know. Me too. Me too. Even when I'm, (laughs) yeah, when I'm doing my professional look is still slightly off kilter. Yeah. I think that that doesn't mean that you're right. It's like, it's just, it means buying better made things. I mean, even like my, the quilted coat that I make sort of like a little bit of a bolero style, it kind of falls naturally, like just around where your natural waist is kind of. And it's one of those things that like, I've had, like I said earlier, I've had a lot of friends try on, you know, friends who are really narrow and small friends who have like a lot of curves and like a little bit bigger, you know, a whole range of people. And it just like, really flattering on a lot of people and it's really versatile it's like a versatile silhouette that you could wear with a t-shirt and jeans you could wear it with a dress you know and and that's the kind of pieces that i want to wear i want to make for people as well where Mm -hmm. it's like something that has a cool interesting print but like that you can wear a lot of different things with and that to me is more of like the idea of like capsule wardrobe and you know buying things that you'll get use out of but that doesn't mean they're boring and beige um it just means something that makes you feel good We've been bombarded by this idea of basics for like the past 20 years. I mean, this is like an actual initiative for a lot of retailers to sell you tons of 
what they call basics, which are just these semi-disposable t-shirts, leggings, right. you know, kind of crappy button-ups, uh, hoodies. I mean, all we're really mm-hmm. talking about is loungewear right here anyway. I don't know why we're selling it. Right. Yeah. <laughs> when we talk about the, the basic essential pieces of your wardrobe, it doesn't mean basic in the way that we've been brainwashed to believe it is. Like we're talking things that you're going to wear a lot in a lot of different ways. They're really useful to you, but they can also be really cool. And like I will, I will have a link to Jenny's work in the show notes because I got to tell you they're anything but basic <laughs> like her jackets but yeah. <laughs> could be worn in nine gazillion different ways and for a very long time and they have this timeless appeal to them yeah that's what I'm aiming for and I also on the size tip as somebody too who's you know like things happen you go up you go down is that like I want to make silhouettes and garments that are you have some wiggle room again I think that's part of like being a longevity piece you know like some I have friends who like had a baby, lost a lot of weight, gained a lot. And then you end up like having to like redo your whole wardrobe and it's kind of a bummer. And so the pieces that I make too are not super um, restricting in the sense that like, you know, if you like lost a little weight or gained a little weight or had a kid or, you know, whatever life may happen, they're flexible in that sense too, which I really like that idea. Love that. So once again, we're saying like, hey, the step one to stemming the tide of all this fabric in the landfills is to buy less stuff. But what do you do with, you know, there's, there's going to be stuff that you aren't going to own anymore. Like one thing Jenny called out, like you might have a baby and your clothes don't fit anymore. Hey, it fucking happens. Or you lose weight, you gain weight. I mean, all all kinds of things could happen, right? What do you do with the stuff that you know you're not going to wear anymore? And once again, I want to reiterate, do not go into your bedroom right now and start purging stuff from your closet just because you think you need a capsule wardrobe, please (laughs) stop. I feel like that's always step one to this capsule wardrobe. It's really misguided is to like go throw everything out. We're not saying (laughs) that. So let's say you have stuff that like you're not just artificially throwing away because you're worried about it sparking joy. We're actually like, it's just not going to fit into your life anymore. (laughs) What do you do with it? Okay. The first thing is that you should not put it in the trash, which it's a complicated thing because we know that not everything's being recycled. So like, isn't going to end up in the landfill anyway? Well, it might, but it has a better chance of being turned into something else or reused if you don't put it in the trash. So every year, 10 million tons of clothing and home textiles are donated to charities, churches, thrift shops, those big metal donation bins that you'll find in parking lots. I mean, like so much stuff. One thing I learned, uh, I don't know if you see these, you maybe don't see these as much in New York where you live, Jenny, but there are these like big metal bins that will say like donations for reuse. And like, there's this target that we go to that has them like in the back of the parking lot. And I, my laundromat in LA had them in the parking lot as well. And I've never used them, but apparently those donations for reuse, it's kind of a sketchy situation. They're not. Yeah. I've heard that. Yeah, it's not going into the community. Like they're not going to homeless shelters or like a thrift store. Those bins are actually owned by private textile waste companies that make a considerable profit. They might donate a tiny, tiny bit of the profits to the organizations they claim to support. But I mean, it's like, it's not even impactful. Yeah. These clothes will be turned into things like carpet padding, industrial rags, and insulation. So yeah, I guess they're being recycled, but... If the stuff you're donating, you know, is nice and could be of use to someone, this is not the place to go. Right. Only 20% of donated clothes will be worn again by someone in the community for two reasons. One, there's so much stuff being donated. And two, the ever decreasing quality of fast fashion makes these things kind of unwearable. Like it, it makes sense, right? Yeah. Just there's just no use to it. If it has a broken zipper, who's going to wear that? Or if it's stained or it's like pilling or has pools. I mean, I'm not going to go buy that stuff from the thrift store. Right. Also, there's a phenomenon, which I was unaware of, of a lot of people donating like to the Goodwill, for example, or anywhere else, wet or moldy clothing. (laughs) Did you have... Isn't that crazy? I mean, I think that might, even just by accident, that stuff might happen, you know? Yeah, like, yeah. Where, you, like, things that are dirty or, like, they've been sitting, you know, in a bag and you didn't realize something was a little damp. And then, it, you know, it's like, I mean, yeah. And then, and then the sorting end of that, when they get donated, it's like, oof. 
Oh stuff. God, I know that is not a job I want. I decided yeah. like, you know, I wanted to learn about the flow of our donations because it's so mysterious. And I mean, you and I, we're yeah. hardcore thrifters. We know there's some sketchy business and we know that the, the Goodwill is oh, actually yeah. a for-profit <laughs> company. So that kind of changes things yeah. too, right? So I decided like, okay, the Goodwill to me, at least in my mind, is the most corrupt of the thrift stores. Yes. <laughs> so I wanted to know how it works. So at the Goodwill, the donations are sorted and they remove everything that's mildewed, wet, stained, in poor condition, or this is a word that fills me with like shutters, uh, soiled. <laughs> If it's soiled, <laughs> that you know that involves poop, right? For sure. Yeah. Oh. Soiled stuff is like poop, blood, that kind of thing. So yeah. <laughs> that stuff, probably not a surprise. That goes to the landfill. I mean, stuff that would be literally dangerous to resell or recycle. And once again, right. this happens a lot because people are donating poopy, wet, moldy, stained clothes. Like, <laughs> you know, just don't do that. One uh. thing I read said that if you have poopy, wet, stained clothes to, to Joni <laughs> that you should you need to take a hard look at your life and figure I out mean, what's going step wrong step one yeah like if you have an excess that's of our that's our clothes, official step yeah if you have an excess of poopy wet clothes in your life just sit down for a minute you, you know need what? to get a grip on reality i want you i want take a deep breath we'll I, figure it out yeah i want you to reach out to us we're going to help you figure this out. Like why, <laughs> why is your life filled with poopy wet clothes? We can help you. Uh, and why are you passing that along? Yeah. Else to deal yeah. With I mean, also? that is like a whole other thing. So the, the advice I read is if you do somehow have all of these poopy wet clothes, <laughs> you should contact your city sanitation department to see what to do with them. Because especially if there's like poop involved, they do not want that in your trash can yeah. either because it's re really hazardous right. for the work sanitation workers. Uh, so anyway, hopefully yeah. this isn't as widespread as I'm now envisioning it. Uh, <laughs> but don't donate that stuff to the Goodwill because you're really gumming up the works literally and figuratively because it contaminates everything else that's yeah. donated with it. So the, the poor, those poor suffering Goodwill workers, they sort through it all. I hope they're in a hazmat suit. They pick the things that are not disgusting. And that goes to stores. And in general, once again, I'm going to say I take all this with a grain of salt because I do not trust the Goodwill. Uh, <laughs> I'm not a conspiracy yeah. theorist, but I am about the Goodwill. I might be. Yeah. <laughs> but I might so, be. <laughs> uh, the garments are given four weeks to sell in the regular Goodwill store. And then they are moved to the Goodwill outlet, which you know we and our family call the bins. A lot of people call it that. And that's where yep. if you yep. haven't been to one of these... Shit gets Shit real. Gets it's real. actually, it's too intense for me because you want to talk about people who me make too. a living off of finding cool shit and then reselling it. Like that's what happens at the bins. And those people are barracudas. Yeah. And it's just so everybody in that whole, in any kind of the outlet situation, it's just like either they're dealers or it's just like women that are like collecting like decent clothes and then distribute that in their community or selling them. I don't know, but it's mm -hmm. very cutthroat. And that's kind of kills the vibe for me a little bit. It, it does. It does. And now my husband and my daughter love the bins and there's a Goodwill bins in Delaware that they really love. And I will say they find some really cool shit. Yeah. But once again, I can't handle the anxiety of it yeah. because basically what happens is they roll out these bins and everybody descends on it and digs shit out and they just take everything that is remotely appealing to them, which they'll sort through later. Yeah. And, and it's those bins are out pound, for a certain amount right? of time. Yeah, 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 it's by the pound. Uh, and it's 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 somewhat divided. Like they'll have a clothing textile area. There'll be like a home goods, hard goods section, maybe some electronics. But once again, it's the dig. You wear gloves. Even pre-COVID, you would yeah. definitely wear gloves. There's a lot of hand sanitizer flowing. And you do have people there who are reselling on eBay, on Etsy. They're hunting for their own vintage store. They are looking for non-vintage clothes in good condition to sell on Poshmark or in their own consignment store. You know, like, so people are there building businesses. And so as a rando thrift shopper, I just feel like I'm out of my league. I have definitely, I was hit with a book one time at the oh, Goodwill shit. Bins in Portland. Uh, I also have had someone step on my foot and then grind their heel into it on purpose. So I would move. So yeah. I just it's stay away. I can't, I can't, I'm a big baby. I can't handle the pressure. So <laughs> stuff goes to the outlet. Now these bins are 
massive. And no, not everything gets bought out of them. I mean, I would say like a small percentage of stuff right. gets bought there. Uh, after that, they moved to, I didn't know this existed, these Goodwill auctions where it's kind of like that show where people bid on storage units. Oh, yeah. Storage wars. Yes, yes. It's kind of like storage wars where people will bid online on just random lots of Goodwill stuff. They have no idea what it's going to be until they get it. And then they can kind of scrap around with it. And once again, this can be a smart thing if you are not maybe looking for vintage, but you're looking for stuff for your Poshmark store. or Or even just like less sexy than that. Just people who have like straight up secondhand stores, you know, and like smaller communities that's just like, it's just literally secondhand goods. Doesn't have to be like cool or collectible or anything where people are just like buying because it's cheaper and you know that kind of stuff so there's that too I think Mm -hmm. yeah absolutely absolutely so after that there's still a lot of stuff left and they move on to recycling companies so the article that I read that it was a HuffPost article that but you know Goodwill blessed it so once again I'm just telling you what it said I take it with (laughs) a grain of salt they move everything on to these recycling companies and there's one called Smart and 45% of the clothing that makes it to Smart is either resold into the U.S. used clothing industry, once again, maybe filling up thrift stores or uh, secondhand stores or, you know, online dealers, or, and this is way more problematic, it's sent overseas into markets with more demand. The U.S. is the largest exporter of secondhand clothing. It exports over a billion pounds of used clothing every year. To be fair, 70% of the world's population uses secondhand clothes sort of as their primary clothing source. But I've done a lot of research and reading about how our excessive clothing consumption and our need to ship it out of our country, and it's not just the United States, it's Canada, Australia, the UK, certain parts of Europe, all this clothing is flooding countries and preventing them from having a textile industry of their own. And the, the clothes that we're sending them are not necessarily any good which we've talked about, right? Like how many wares are you going to get out of some of these things? So it's not ideal for the stuff to be shipped overseas. I guess it's better than going into a landfill. However, a lot of it goes into a landfill on a different continent. So we're just spreading the misery around. It's like giving them the problem to be like, okay, here, here, we're donating this to you. We're being so generous. And then it's like half of it or more is probably not wearable or, you know, And so then they have to deal with the problem of like getting rid of it. Right. So it's like rotting on their land, leaching into their water supply. It's it's not good. So 30% of the donated clothes that Smart receives get cut into rags for industrial use. 20% is processed into a soft fiber filling for furniture, home insulation, car soundproofing, those kinds of things where we don't think about there being textiles involved. It's like a filler. Right. The remaining garments head to the landfill. And if you do the math, it comes to 5%. But when we're talking about like billions of pounds of clothes, this is still a lot of stuff. They go to the landfill generally only because somehow after all of this, there are still some moldy or mildewed clothes left. So this wet clothing just spreads the wealth. Like if you donate one wet thing, it turns into everything the Goodwill took in that day getting moldy over time. Right. Right. So donating is good because still, once again, most of it is being used somehow, although some of it's going places where it's going to sit and rot and others are going to the landfill anyway. So I think we need to talk about like, how do we as people on our own individuals minimize our waste? And, you know, we already talked about like buying clothes that are last a long time that we really love that are special. Uh, We could resell our stuff. I don't know. Do you ever do that, Jenny? Do you like resell your stuff? Actually, this is a good time to talk about this. My my friends over the years, I mean, I've been in New York now for like about 20 years. And ever since I was like, you know, first got here and was in my early 20s and we had these clothing swaps. And I've heard of clothing swaps in a variety of different ways to like execute that. But I we just did it very simply where it was like, a group of like females that I know, ladies, whatever. And, you know, they could bring a friend. And the whole idea is like bring stuff that you're okay giving away 
that you wouldn't be like mm-hmm. want to sell or something like that. Or that fight okay. with someone. Yeah, or fight. <laughs> well, I did not tolerate that. There was a no tolerance policy for that. Like that happened once where someone brought someone who was grabby. And I was like, we don't <gasps> do that here. It's a, it's a yeah. very safe place. It's like, like, even if you bring a friend, that friend needs to be vetted where they're like chill. They're not, it's not like, what am I going to get from these other people? Like we can't have that vibe. It has to be like people that are coming with nice, decent things and everybody's kind of on the same page and it's supportive and whatever. So that was always the vibe. And we were very lucky. We didn't have a lot of people that were not like that. And really that's what it is. It's like you come and as long as everybody's sort of participating on the same level, you know, it doesn't feel weird because everyone's bringing cool things and, Mm -hmm. and sharing. Mm -hmm. And that's been an awesome way to sort of, you know, you had something that like, again, your size fluctuates or, you know, you, you're like, you know what, I thought I could pull this like 80s secretary vibe off, but I really can't. And maybe someone works in a more, you know, like corporate environment, like I can do that, you know, so I've had a lot of awesome exchanges that way. And even what we call for like the basics, it's like, oh, I have these, you know, some t shirts, and I'm just like, I just don't wear them here, you wear, them. you know, so that's been an awesome way to ch- kind of share a lot of that. And some of that stuff's been passed around to my friends, like a jean jacket that has sort of been passed around or a purse or something. So that's definitely one way I have sold some things on like eBay or or, um, Etsy, you know, things like that. Like I bought a pair of sneakers that were the wrong size and I couldn't return them. So I sold them on, you know, sell them for a little bit cheaper and you're like, whatever. So I think those are good ways, like start with your community. You know, if like you have a bag of clothes, like have your friend look through it or, you know, like I have a lot of younger women I've met through the years too, like in New York that like, you know, we're struggling a little bit. I was like, Hey, look through this bag of clothes. Cause I'm going to drop it off anyway. And, and they're like thrilled. They're like, Oh my God, I just got all this new stuff for my order, but I didn't have to like spend a ton of money on it or anything, you know? So Beacon's Closet is something that I've definitely used a ton over the years. And it's good too, because they only, I mean, good and bad. I get a little frustrated because I feel like they take a lot of stuff where I'm like, really this H&M crap? But (laughs) hey, at least, you know, it's going to a good place where someone will reuse it or a lot, you know, buy it and wear it. But they take vintage as well as like, you know, new stuff that's just like stylish or fashionable or anything that would someone would might, you know, want to wear. So you can go and donate. They are very selective, you know, so, and it's kind of, I'm, I don't always understand their selections, but (laughs) you know, I'm, it's like that Broad City episode where like, it's like the snotty beacons girl being like, oh, this piece of shit, you know, okay. (laughs) But I have like beautiful vintage stuff that they're just like, "Mm, no. And they'll take like H&M dresses. I'm like, okay, so whatever. Uh, But at least, you know, you bring your stuff there, they sort through it and then they take what they want and you can either get straight cash, which is less than, you know, it's like the least amount of money of value or you can get store credit so a lot of times i would just do that because they you know i do find stuff there and um everything from like cool weird vintage stuff to like functional like basic you know normal normal people clothes (laughs) (laughs) and that's a a great way to sort of like at least recycle some of your stuff and make sure it's it's going to a place that actually i do think they sell a lot of the stuff that they they take and they will donate it yeah i think that they're on the up and up there's also Buffalo Exchange, which is a little bit more widespread. Uh, I used that a lot when I was living in Portland. I will yeah. say one of the drawbacks to Buffalo and some of the other resale stores like that is that they're also selling new clothes. And I hate that. You'd be like, oh, this is so cute. And then you're like, yeah. wait a minute. This is some brand new fast fashion right. San Pedro Apparel Mart dress. Like, why? Yeah, I don't. I don't like to mix like that either. <laughs> I know. I know. I feel like that makes me distrust places. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know you're going there thinking that you're getting something like secondhand and and for whatever reason you have behind doing that whether it's because you want to support that kind of industry or because you're looking for something unusual and like different and old or you know you're in that mindset you know having something new you're like I, that's not what i came here for so i think it's a little misleading in that way i never find stuff there anyway yeah me neither i mean i used to like i I'm very nostalgic for this early aughts era of Portland where there were still some pretty good thrift stores on the edge of town, but, you know, definitely not anywhere centrally located. But the Buffalo Exchange and the red light were always filled with really awesome vintage clothes that were very affordable. And there was like normal contemporary clothes, too. And yeah, I never bought new clothes unless it was like something really specific, like jeans, which are always yeah. hard for me. I have a huge butt and a small waist. It's really hard to find jeans and, yeah. uh, you know, like tights and socks and underwear and stuff like that. So right. I, I'm bummed that now the Buffalo Exchange is mostly like H&M clothes and new stuff. <laughs> but yeah, it's still an option. And I would still rather uh, your H&M clothes go to another person who's going to enjoy them than Going yeah. trash. 
Absolutely. One other little plug for another place that I just thought of when I, I lived in Boston for like a, a minute after I graduated from school and there was a place called the Garment District. And mm-hmm. it's literally a store, not like an area. Um, it's called the Garment District. And they used to do clothing by the pound, which I think they still do. It might be different weird days. And it was literally like, I remember the first time I went there, it was just a big warehouse, just a sea of fab of clothes on the floor. And I was like, Oh my God. And this was like a long time ago, but, um, but I think they still do it and they do it by the pound. And they also have like a, vi- a gigantic vintage store upstairs. They have some of the really nice vintage. that's like more priced appropriately, but they also have like fairly affordable stuff too. It'll be like, you know, a whole rack of like Bajas or like, you know, things like that, where they just like take quantity in of like different genre things so that's like a cool place to go check out too for like recycled things that have some interesting options and they just are doing it on like a bigger scale yeah i know i love that i love that and if anybody has any other suggestions they should reach out because you know there's got to be stuff all over the country that that is a great resource so something you and i talked about earlier was sort of like finding that balance between sustainability and affordability yep I don't even have a job right now, you know, and I've, right. I've spent you. more of my life being broke paycheck to paycheck than not. So I'm really sensitive to this idea that is out there for a lot of different reasons that things that are ethically made, that are sustainable, that are going to stand the test of time are often very expensive. And, you know, sometimes that's the case, to be honest, sometimes there's stuff that is selling at a premium because it's allegedly sustainable, but it's just really greenwashing and marketing. Right. I always cite Reformation as an example of that. Like their product is not long lasting. The fabrics are kind of shitty. It's really, really expensive, you know? So yeah. that kind of confuses the situation. Why is most sustainable stuff, why does it feel like a luxury? Right. Yeah. And it shouldn't, I mean, the reality is it really shouldn't be, but um, I think there's a couple different ways to sort of look at it. I think that some of these bigger companies, you know, like an H&M or people who are making what we call like the basics, like people who are making leggings and t-shirts and underwear and stuff, those people have to start, those companies have to start really looking at their waste and 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 making better choices and using recycled and, and kind mm-hmm. of going in that direction. You know, like when we talk about the whole like everyone last year or the year before was talking about like straws, right? Everyone was like so mad at plastic straws. I get it. Mm-hmm. But you know, like me as a person, yes, I have met my, my metal straws and I can you know use my metal straws. But if a company like McDonald's, you know, or whoever, these fast foods invest in these kind of better products, then that makes a bigger impact. So I think that's one thing, you know, the old navies and, and the places where people who don't have a ton of money and they're just trying to like, clothe themselves and their family and just like get by like they should be able to be buying more sustainable options in these bigger companies so there's like that side of it but I think like you know how it like sort of relates to my business where I mean quite honestly like if I was really gonna I could probably some of the jackets could be more expensive but I want them to be within reach for people and so I think it's going back to that like making better choices you know back in the day my grandmother and her sister had a bridal shop in the Lower East Side so they made gowns and they would make like you know prom dresses and things like that and I think that like people used to just get one or two or three dresses a year tops Mm -hmm, you know and mm -hmm. that was it not that I think that everyone should you know not buy clothes. But I think if we go back to like more sort of mindful way of thinking about clothing and and understanding what it takes to make those clothes, if you buy a jacket, that's a little bit, maybe a touch more expensive, but it's going to last a lot longer Then it, you know, when you, when you start breaking that down, it actually could be more accessible to, to, to everybody in a weird way. It's hard because it's like retraining, you know, society of like how this works everyday people shouldn't necessarily they're not the ones that need to like it's like the bigger companies and people starting to like kind of restructure the way that we do this I think is really where it needs to start but it's tough because people are just like I mean even myself I mean before I really kind of dove into you know working for other textile companies and, and and looking at stuff in a different way you're like wow why is that so expensive and you're like because you know the garbage that you're buying that's cheap a somebody didn't get paid for that if you're buying a dress that's $15, $20, I mean, just that blows my mind now because A, they're just going so fast and they're making things just so fast and 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 poorly that because they have to just get through the production. But someone didn't get paid on the other end. I think about that all the time when something's so cheap. It's so cheap for a reason. Oh, absolutely. I have read a statistic which makes sense to me when I try to unpack 
the cost of things, that 3% of what you pay for a garment is going to pay all the people involved in making it. Yeah. 3%. So if you buy a $20 dress, 60 cents of that is paying all the workers who cut the fabric, made the fabric, yeah. made the zipper, sewed the dress, put it in the box, shipped it away. I mean, this is crazy. Yeah. So gross. And it, that's in some ways one of the like saddest things about fast fashion yeah. for me, like the hardest for me to digest and accept. Absolutely. I should have brought this up earlier, but like, you know, because of my family too, that growing up in like basically a garment centric world, my great aunt and my grandmother were seamstresses and they made clothes. And I think once you start looking at like how much time and effort and like skill it takes to like make one garment, like a jacket or a dress or whatever, you're like, oh, wow. And then you think about people who are doing that on the other end in this climate and like, you know, fast fashion and hot, quick production. And it's really kind of freaky because it's like, you know, that's not where we should be. Mm -hmm. You know, that just mm -hmm. goes back to, again, like not overproducing. You know, you can still buy a variety of things throughout the year um, that are interesting and cool and different and stylish. But, you know, just like making better choices, I think is really what people need to start understanding and, and respect the sort of like process of what it takes behind the scenes to make these things. I think once you open your eyes to that, which, you know, I've done over the past, even just like even so more over the past like five years is really being like oh okay it just like really opens up your world and I think it helps you understand why something's more expensive sometimes and you know, like you said too there's also like companies that things are just more expensive and it's a little bit eye rolly and like ridiculous because I do know what it costs to make that <laughs> but I think transparency is important I love that that's like kind of a tr not trend but like something that's happening more now where smaller companies are being more transparent and being like hey this is where we make this and these are the people who do it and I think that's important for us to all just like open our eyes and see like what's really going on here behind the scenes and we'll change your attitude going forward. Absolutely. And I do think, you know, yes, the big changes need to be made by the companies that make all this stuff. But having worked in that industry for a long time, there is no intention to change anytime soon. Yeah. And the only way that is going to happen is if these companies stop making as much money. Yeah. That's what's really going to speak to the people working in those organizations. And that means we have to withhold our money, right. buy less, buy from different people. Right. Yeah. It's like any industry, right? If you continue to support an industry that is not doing things properly, then yeah. And, and that's hard because I feel like, you know, there's people who just like, nobody's got time for that. They just need to like buy a thing and get out of here. And, you know, so I, I get that too. But I think people who are thinking about the, these things can start making some of those changes and, and hopefully there will be a shift. You know, if people slow down and stop buying tons of old Navy or tons of H and M or whatever, I mean, I've stopped doing that. Like I, you know, I was guilty of that just as much as anyone else, you know, being like, Oh, I'm going to grab this sweater. It's so cute. And it's cheap. And then it's like, it pills and it's gross. And I, I just start getting bummed out, honestly. And I just stopped buying synthetics. I don't buy synthetic sweaters anymore unless it's vintage, you know, or something, but for the most part, I'm like, I'm not buying this kind of material. Even beyond like all the stuff behind it, it was just kind of a bummer too. <laughs> Maybe people will identify on that on that level where it's just like, it's just a bummer to buy a sweater that you think is adorable. And then you wear it three times mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. the seams start ripping and it's pilling. I think on that tip, people can maybe relate to that too, is if they don't really like, I don't care about the behind the scenes, then care about your hard-earned money and like, <laughs> and buying something and that you'll actually enjoy and have. Yeah. I mean, there's an argument here for everybody, <laughs> woke or yeah. not. Right. And I, right. I found over the years, because, you know, I was a young adult as fast fashion came up. Right. And so this is where I would buy my clothes. I would buy a new outfit to go out every weekend, if not two, even when I was broke, I would figure out a way to do it. And like, I found over time that it was having this sort of adverse effect on my mental health, like where I would feel really excited and then get it home and realize it was shitty and feel a little sadder or only be able to wear it two times. And then yeah. it sat in my closet taking up all the space, but it was pilly or discolored yeah. or the zipper was broken. And then it was this burden. And this is before right. I even, I mean, I don't think any of us had any inkling before the, like the last five years that these clothes were all being made in really sketchy, dangerous ways, you know, yeah. now adding that on top of it, like that excitement that you're supposed to feel when you put on something new, where it makes you feel like magical and like undefeatable, that right. 
feeling is gone. <laughs> It just isn't there at all. And there are a lot of times ill-fitting even, yeah. especially as someone who's like myself, who's not like a stick, you know, you like go and you're like, oh, this is going to be great. And then you take it home and you're like, you're right. It's like zippers weird. It's like p- pulling in weird areas. And it kind of makes you feel bummed out. Mm-hmm. So you like already wore it once and now you're not going to wear it again. And there's like this, you're right. There's this weird like burden on you now because you're like, I spent my money on this and now what am I going to do with this? Yeah. So even if you don't care about other people or the environment, Think about yourself. (laughs) And you know, (laughs) some people, I mean, listen, especially today in 2020, it's really easy to feel like you are so powerless in the world, whether it's like the things that happen politically in our country or this industry that makes all these clothes that like poison the planet. Like what can you as one individual do? But I'm going to tell you this, these things work. And this is the example that I cite. Remember how the millennials killed Applebee's? (laughs) allegedly. Oh, yeah. What really happened is people were like, like, you know, people of our age were like, I don't want to eat shitty food when I go out to a restaurant. You know, I don't want to eat a bunch of preservatives and like weird sauces that have like tons of sodium and sugar. And I want to eat fresh, delicious, authentic food. And so we weren't even consciously saying, hey, we're not going to give our money to Applebee's anymore because it sucks. We just started eating and doing things that were right for us. And you know what? Applebee's is like probably going to go out of business. Right. Like the millennials killed Applebee's just by voting with their dollar for better food. Right. And we can do that with the apparel industry. I mean, we're going to see so many bankruptcies. We already have this year. There's going to be a ton more in the next year. And I would say put the pressure on these retailers by not buying things from them call them out on social media. If you're having a bad day, go for it. You know, sometimes that can make you feel a bit more empowered too. Like we can do this and it's going to be a lot easier than we think because right now the world as it exists is sort of forcing change on these companies. And we don't even have to press very hard to make that happen. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Jenny. This was so fun. This is like the most fun episode I've recorded so far. Oh, yay. I'm so glad. Yeah, we have a lot yeah. of similar crossovers, I feel like, in our life. So it's always fun to talk with someone who cares about these things. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All the important things. <laughs> hey, it's me again. First off, I just wanted to say thanks again to Jenny for being the raddest guest. I can't recommend enough that you check out her brand, Late to the Party. And don't worry, I'll post a link in the show notes. I bought an amazing jacket from her in the spring that was made from the upholstery in a magician's house. Like, what an awesome story. (laughs) She also makes incredibly high-quality masks that I use as my, quote, special occasion masks, whatever that means in 2020, but they feel great and they look good. (laughs) Okay. Remember when I was talking about the metal donation bins that you might see in parking lots? As I mentioned, most of them belong to for-profit textile recycling corporations, and they have names like Spin Green and Villatex. What a beautiful name. I mean, really aspirational, really exceptional branding, Villatex. I mean, really sounds like you're doing some good for the world there. (laughs) Anyway, I'm just being mean. As I mentioned, none of these donated clothes are distributed to the community. And I think that's really important to remember that you might think your old clothes are going to go help someone who's in need and they're not, or at least they're probably not when you put them in these bins. We're going to talk about that more. And furthermore, it's sort of like, let's add insult to injury. These bins are often placed illegally. So without the consent of the property owners or the local jurisdiction. And so some cities have had enough and they've been aggressively seizing them over the past few years, like in New York City and Washington, D.C. and probably lots of other places, too. Because once again, even the government is like, oh, this is kind of a scam, I think. But there's one type of these bins that has a very different story, like a really complicated soapy story. Are you ready? (laughs) So the bins that I'm referring to are bright yellow and they say Planet Aid. And these bins have been placed in about half the U.S. states. So if you live on the East Coast or parts of the Midwest, this is going to sound familiar to you. But they also appear with other names like Gaia, Recycle for Change, and U.S. Again. When they show those names, they're painted green. These are placed on the West Coast. So if you live there, these might sound familiar to you. 
So there's just this huge network of these bins. Now, that's not why Planet Aid is interesting, but it's part of the story. And once again, we're talking about tons of donated clothes that Planet Aid and these other bins are collecting. So let's talk about what happens to these donations since we're talking about so much stuff. Well, first, the clothing is picked up from the bins, it's put into a truck, and then it's brought to a warehouse. And I mean, nothing shocking there, right? This isn't the soapy part, I promise. (laughs) So Planet Aid says that occasionally, and that's their exact quote on it, these clothes are sorted out and donated to a local cause. But most, and I mean like a huge majority of the clothing is wrapped in cloth or plastic and then it's bailed into 1,000 pound packages without being sorted. You're already getting a little bit of a sense of dread here. Like what's going to happen next? I know I am. When I start thinking about 1,000 pound bales, I get really weirded out. Well, these bales are then sent to sorting houses where employees go through them and, you know, they sort everything out. That's where the name sorting houses comes from. And they're kind of categorizing the contents by quality and type. And then some of these items, the best quality of these items, will be sold to thrift stores in the United States. So yes, that's right. Not everything in every thrift store was donated specifically to that thrift store. And I actually, after I did all this research, I was just chit-chatting with one of my friends who works in the vintage industry. And she was like, oh yeah, like I know multiple thrift stores that are buying their bins and she rattled them off for me. So if you're really in the scene, then you know this, but I feel like I'm an avid thrifter and I had no idea. And you know, I'm obsessed with thrifting. And already as I dig deeper into this, I'm really being taken aback by how sketchy and secretive the whole industry is. If you have worked or currently work in the thrift store industry, please drop me a line because I want to interview you so badly. I have so many questions and I bet a lot of our listeners do too. If you're listening and you know somebody who works in this industry, send them my way. Okay, so here's where we are so far. The stuff has all been sorted. Some of it, like the best quality stuff, has been sold to thrift stores. So what about the rest? Well, most of this clothing is sold overseas in developing countries. And you knew this was coming, didn't you? I mean, if you've listened to our previous episodes, we've talked about the global used clothing market. And these clothes are primarily sent to Africa and Asia, but they go to all the continents in one way or another. And basically, local vendors will buy these bales from the importers, usually a few bales a week, kind of depending on the size of their business, and then they'll resell the clothing, usually in outdoor markets. So it's complicated from there. Like, is this good or bad? Well, on one hand, selling secondhand clothes can provide a nice middle-class existence for the sellers. On the other hand, most of these clothes end up in landfills just on other continents from where they originated because, you know, the quality or the aesthetic isn't appropriate for reselling. And we're talking like random one-off t-shirts for bachelorette parties and fun runs. You know, there's so many dumb t-shirts in this world that we're never going to wear. I feel like I'm always getting dumb t-shirts from work-related things and I'm like, oh, I'll wear this to bed. But now I have like an infinite supply of t-shirts I could wear to bed and I don't need all of them. I urge you to convert them into rags or cut them up and sew them into other things. Anyway, that's a whole other episode right there. Another thing, I mean, amongst all of the clothes that are going to landfills after making the journeys overseas, there's also a lot of Halloween costumes and just clothes that are like fast fashion. They're such low quality. They aren't worth reselling. They don't have any value. They're not going to hold up for the buyer. Furthermore, and we've touched on this in the past, importing our unwanted clothing has essentially killed the domestic textile and clothing industries in these countries because our cast off clothing is always going to be cheaper than something made in that country. So it's just not good for the local economies, even though you know, when you step back and aren't really seeing all the nuance around it, you're like, oh, this is great. It's creating these jobs and businesses for people. But then you step in a little closer and you're like, oh, wait, but none of these economies now have a self-sufficient textile and garment industry because it's been stifled by all these cheap used clothes. It's, it's complicated. But the most important thing I can say is this wouldn't be happening if we weren't buying so much stuff we don't need. Okay, let's get back to Planet Aid. 
Planet Aid and a lot of these other donation box companies are selling our stuff overseas. I mean, and once again, I'm going to say this multiple times, very little to almost none of these donations are benefiting local causes. And, you know, there's a lot of stuff that's being donated that isn't actually wearable. Maybe it's stained, it's, you know, torn, it has a broken zipper. So these are either chopped up into insulation or industrial rags, or it just goes to the landfill anyway. In 2018, according to the IRS, Planet Aid made $33 million off of selling donated clothes. So this is where it starts to get complicated. Planet Aid alleges that 85% of the money, so 85% of that $33 million, is used to fund various social causes. And you know, they have, I mean, we'll go into some of them, but they have things going all over the globe. A big part of it is in Africa where they are, you know, there's a lot of education and food related initiatives, but they've got schools, they have like environmental education programs, allegedly. <laughs> I couldn't find a lot of detail about that. But anyway, so they're supposedly doing all this stuff. Well, Charity Watch, which is an independent charity watchdog that has been around for 20 years, they assert that Planet Aid is spending only 25 to 34% of its money on charitable causes. And when we're talking about charities, that's a very bad statistic. You really want this to be closer to that 85% that Planet Aid is alleging. Now, I think it's also important to remind you that Planet Aid is getting all the stuff they sell for free. So zero cost. They still have overhead, of course, though, like the bins, you know, they got to make them, they got to paint them, they got to place them, they have to maintain them, maybe they clean them sometimes. They have the staff that empties them and sorts the donations. I can only assume that the donation sorting is expensive. There's trucks and shipping and delivering, the bailing machine. But overall, it's a good low-cost business to start, right? So Planet Aid does a lot of what I call creative accounting, basically saying that if they didn't pick up all those donated clothes, they would go to the landfill. And so their argument is, hey, we're doing a good charitable thing for the earth. And therefore, they can count all those overhead costs. So like the bins, the pickup of the donations and the sorting, they can count all of that as the donation. Basically, they're saying all of their overhead expenses are actually a donation to the planet. <laughs> so they're counting that as part of the money they're donating. Does that make sense? Well, I'm sure you're calling bullshit on this and you're not alone because Charity Watch also calls bullshit on this. Basically, Charity Watch is saying, hey, you don't have proof that you and specifically you, Planet Aid, are diverting these clothes from the landfill because the donated items could have gone to a local organization that would have both distributed the items to the needy and sold the remaining stuff at a lower cost to shoppers who needed that lower price point. Furthermore, then whatever they sold, they could have used that money to fund their own public service program. So Charity Watch is like, dude, this stuff could have been utilized in such a bigger, more powerful, beneficial way than just, oh, we're saving it from the landfill. It makes sense. When you really dig into it, it's like, oh, yeah, you're right. Why would I put my clothes in those bins? But wait, that's not the end of the story about Planet Aid. <laughs> That would have been exciting enough, right? You know, for a show about fashion and sustainability and doing the right thing. That would have been enough. But wait, there's more. And this is where I have to tread lightly because Planet Aid is extraordinarily litigious. So Reveal is a Canadian news program. And they, in partnership with NBC Washington, dug up IRS records showing that Planet Aid makes up to $42 million per year. So that $33 million they made that one year was kind of low. That money, as I've mentioned, is supposed to be donated to needy communities in places like Malawi and Mozambique. And it's supposed to be used for things like food and education. The FBI, yes, now the FBI is involved, has conceded that, quote, little to no money actually goes to these causes. Yeah, the FBI, because the FBI has been investigating Planet Aid's parent organization. Oh, yeah, that's right. There's a parent organization. Are you ready to hear about that? <laughs> so 
Planet Aid appears to be controlled. I mean, not even controlled, just like part of a Danish organization called Twin or the Teachers Group. It was founded in the 70s by Mergen Zamdi Peterson. And I totally blew that pronunciation because I don't know anything Danish. <laughs> anyway, the Teachers Group had its roots in Denmark as an anti-war commune. Well, that sounds good, you know, and I like teachers, so this sounds great. I would love the teachers to have a group. They do such hard work, and now they're anti-war. So, like, what's the problem here? Well, the teachers group began to grow. It eventually became an experimental traveling high school, which also sounds cool. And that expanded into an organization that was dedicated to collecting used clothing in Europe. So now you're like, okay, hmm, that is a coincidence that the teachers group and Planet Aid are collecting used clothing. And eventually, the teachers group was providing support to 1970s revolutionary movements in Southern Africa. So nothing too weird so far, right? And once again, we're talking about a teachers group. That sounds great. Well, this organization is a cult. Like, the Danish court has decreed that it is a secular humanitarian cult. Well, how do we know it's a cult, you're asking? And also, how did we go from talking about clothing donation bins to cults? I don't know. We live in a crazy world, guys. So members are instructed to live collectively, as in all together. Starting to sound a little culty. They have to transfer all of their available income to joint savings and forego their personal rights, such as the right to start a family to their own wish. So, okay, wait give up all their money, live with everybody else who's a member, and, oh yeah, give up my right to have a child when or if I want to. Hmm. Yep, sounds like a cult. <laughs> Furthermore, the founder, Peterson, is an internationally wanted man, like Interpol is looking for him. He has, among many things, allegedly committed fraud and tax evasion in his own country, and there's speculation, because he's been on the run for a while, that he may be hiding out in a $25 million, 494-acre compound in Baja, Mexico. And I looked at some aerial photography of it, and it looks like it would be part of a new futuristic section of Disneyland. Like, it looks really rad from the sky. And it's huge. The complex has marble offices, meeting rooms, 140 hotel-like bedrooms, I guess, so everybody can live communally, a fitness center, a swimming pool, a spa, a movie theater, and restaurants. I mean, this place is huge. The same FBI file that I mentioned earlier alleges that Peterson has started companies and organizations all over the world that benefit the teachers group. And it's kind of complicated, well, especially as just the average layperson, to connect all of these dots to the teachers group, but Danish law enforcement found a document where Peterson instructed his closest followers to ensure funds collected by their charities, and this is all going to be in quotes now, are placed so that at any time they are available to us, that they are never available to others, and that they are protected from the theft, taxation, and prying by unauthorized persons, okay? And here's another thing he asked them to do lay down a twisted access path with only ourselves as compass holders. So basically, we're going to hide all this money, but we'll all know where it is. No one else will be able to touch it. So that means like governments, any other private groups, etc. We're definitely not going to pay taxes on it. And most importantly, we're going to make getting to the money and figuring out where it's all coming from just so convoluted and complicated that no one will actually be able to figure out how much money we have. And they're doing a pretty good job. I mean, this still is coming to light. The other thing is that they actually like hire people to work for them. And that includes Americans. A Maryland woman who responded to a Planet Aid job posting on Craigslist. Yeah, guys, beware on Craigslist. One more reason. Told NBC that she was asked to panhandle for money as part of her training. All that money went back to Planet Aid. She was asked to work around the clock. And this is the super weird part. She was going to be paid $28,000 a year for this job, but she was required to give 20% of that salary back to finance a training program at a really creepy complex called 
One World Center in Michigan. While the One World Center is operated by the Institute of International Cooperation and Development, which is, guess what, also operated by the teachers group. So basically, she was going to be paid by Planet Aid, and Planet Aid is directly connected to the teachers group. And then she was going to give part of that salary paid to her by Planet Aid back to the teachers group. (laughs) It was almost like money laundering when you think about it, right? Trying to make this money look clean. Just putting that out there. I'm not an expert on money laundering, but I've seen some TV shows. <laughs> the thing is, she's not the only person who has this story, and there are tons of them. Another recruit made it as far as Mozambique. Like, he got through the crazy training. He panhandled for money. He worked all the time. And finally, here he was. He was in Africa. He was going to make a difference. He was achieving his goals. He was going to do this great thing. He gets there where he's supposed to set up a teacher's college. When he asked Planet Aid for books and other materials, because, you know, you need these things for a teacher's college, he was told to ask his friends and family to buy them because the group could not afford it. And the other thing, he also was being asked to give 20% of his salary to the teacher's group. So he, he, you know, he had no choice. He really wanted to do this job. He really believed in the cause. He gets there. It's kind of a scam. He has to come home. And this has happened to a lot of people, people from all over the world, a lot of Western countries, but also like people in the countries where this aid is supposed to be happening. They are also being short shifted when they take on jobs here with this organization. So it's sketchy, right? Several European countries have expelled charities connected with teachers group because once again, it's like a serpentine path to find all of these different charities. And some of these countries that have expelled them include Denmark, Great Britain, and France. And in France, they labeled the organization a non-religious cult. They've also been accused of running fake schools for at-risk youth, really just taking advantage of like a modern problem. But it's just a money-making scheme where no one learns anything, I guess. And there's many, many other charitable projects going on that may or may not be what they seem. Meanwhile, Planet Aid still enjoys nonprofit status here in the United States, even though Europe is like, no, these guys are, they're up to no good. What does that mean? Well, it means that Planet Aid and any of the other adjacent groups are not paying taxes, even though it seems as if they're making some profit here, right? That's ironic to me because they've been called out by so many watchdog groups and the FBI has been investigating them for fraud. Furthermore, the group continues to receive USDA, that's the United States Department of Agriculture. Well, they're receiving USDA funds for programs in Africa. Most of them are food related, obviously, food and farming. Documents obtained by the Center for Investigative Reporting stated that a USDA program analyst who visited the project in Malawi was concerned that basically the group was using the funds ineffectively and there was little to no transparency about how the money was being spent. Still to this day, the USDA is funding programs through Planet Aid and all of the other groups. By the way, this is also important to bring up, in 2017, Planet Aid sued the Center for Investigative Reporting for libel over their reporting regarding Planet Aid's business practices and relations with the teachers group. And I'll share some links to some of their reporting to you because I am only scratching the surface here. Uh, Planet Aid is, is alleging a conspiracy to interfere with Planet Aid's business, like an intentional just like trying to bring them down. And so since then... The CIR has indicated that it cost them millions and millions of dollars to fight this case with no resolution. The CIR is saying, basically, they're suing us to drain us financially so that we can't do more reporting. It's really scary. So what's the final takeaway here? Well, don't put your donations in the metal bins. Drop them off at the Goodwill, the Salvation Army, your local thrift store. I mean, there are also local shelters and churches to consider. There are so many options here. There are a couple more organizations that I can recommend. One is Dress for Success, which is a nonprofit, and they provide women with professional attire. So like wear to work clothing. If you have some of that sitting around that you don't want anymore, this is a great organization. It helps women get jobs. It's a really great use of those work clothes you don't want to wear anymore because you just Zoom all the time now or something. 
The other one is Cinderella Project, and it's a nonprofit that collects basically, you know, formal and semi-formal dresses for high school girls so they can go to prom and homecoming and other formal events, whatever their school's doing. That could be a really great use for all of those dresses you bought for last summer's weddings. I'm just saying, keep it in mind. So once again, in summary, do not drop your donations into these bins. I know I've said that like eight times, but I can't say it enough. And please, now that you know why you shouldn't, tell your friends the same thing. Instead, we should focus on local charities and thrift stores. And I know this can be less convenient, especially if you're driving around to like five different places. But one of the things about being a conscious consumer is that sometimes it takes a little bit more time and effort to do things the right way. Like you could eat a Cliff Bar for dinner and it would require the minimal effort. and You know, you'd feel reasonably full, but it's a whole lot healthier and will make you feel better to actually go home and chop up some veggies and cook a meal. So what I'm saying is doing things the right way is rarely easier, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't do it. Thanks for listening to another episode of Close Horse. If you like what you're hearing, please rate, review, and subscribe on Apple Podcasts. And tell a friend. I get so excited when you guys share our posts on Instagram. It like makes my day. Hey, did you know that 10% of American workers work in retail? That's a lot of people. Yet they're often overlooked when we talk about workers' rights and, quote, bringing back the jobs. I am working on an upcoming series of episodes about retail workers, their struggles, and their fight for fair wages and better conditions. If you've worked retail, and I bet a lot of you have, I would like to hear your stories. Did things happen that made it hard for you to do your job, that made it hard for you to, you know, make a living and pay your bills? Did you witness a lot of unprofessional behaviors, harassment? Did you work under dangerous conditions? Are you working in a retail store in the time of COVID? I mean, there are so many things to talk about. Collecting your stories will help me frame out what I need to research and discuss. So I need you to make this happen. And I want to get it right. It's really important to me. This is a cause that I'm super passionate about. And I think that most people aren't thinking about on a day-to-day basis. I mean, if they were, they would be nicer when they went shopping, right? Anyway, you can either send your stories via email to closehorsepodcast at gmail.com or via Instagram where you'll find us at closehorsepodcast. And if writing isn't your thing, sometimes it's just really hard to sit down and explain something that happened by writing it out. And in that case, you can just send me a voice memo recorded on your phone or computer. I can make this as anonymous as as you want it to be. Do you want me to say your name? I can. You don't want me to? That's fine too. Do you want me to name where you worked or not? This is all very flexible. We can change all names to protect the innocent and not so innocent. If you think listening to me talk is as good as Nellie Olson's curls, then you should check out my other podcast, The Department, which I co-host with my friend Kim. We talk about trends of all sorts, from fashion to social to food, everything in between. I'll share a link in the show notes. Check it out. And thanks as always to Dustin Travis White for our theme music and audio support. I just want everyone to know that he found an awesome piece of furniture in someone's garbage this week, and it's going to be amazing in our new house. I know all of you guys wanted an update in our scavenging lifestyle. (laughs) All right. Until the next episode. Bye. Bye.